Good evening, everyone. It's a wonderful um, opportunity for me to introduce um, actually Peggy, who will be chairing Jess. And Peggy is, uh, we've had a long relationship in translation, and I'm really very honored to introduce her and uh, to welcome you all to this session. Peggy has done a considerable uh, scholarship on translation, and we started on a wonderful journey together looking at feminist and intersectional translation. And I'm also very happy to welcome with her the Adefra Collective, who have embraced me in their scholarly community, which is how I met Jess when they had a wonderful conference last year on intersectionality. I would like myself very much to uh, introduce Jess, who has been a very great delight to meet and to know, and to know about your important work in translation. And I'm very thankful that you um, accepted this invitation to come and be our keynote speaker. But you'll be hearing more about Jess um, from, from, you will be hearing more about Jess from, uh, from, from Peggy. So without further ado, I will give the microphone to Peggy to welcome her guest, and then we will continue with a wonderful conversation. Thank you. Thank you, my dear. <laughs> yeah, hello, everybody. Um, <laughs> hello. <laughs> Um, it's late in the evening, November. It's dark, it feels like 11, but um, the best is always yet to come. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you um, to the organizers, but especially thank you to my dear friend uh, Vangui Vangoro. We indeed go way back for many, many years now. I was thinking about it and um, well, let's not get into numbers. <laughs> and I felt like uh, that uh, our, our path together is uh, a way of uh, trans translation in diaspora. You know, I remember when we first met um, at a conference uh, for uh, Black European Studies and uh, you introduced us to living and live translation mm -hmm. and it's still in my heart, and I know that um, my fellow sisters from, from Adefra um, remember this moment as well. So I think, uh, yeah, we are living translation into, in, in diaspora. So I'm very, very happy um, to, and honored uh, to uh, moderate, to host uh, this keynote session today uh, by Jess Oliveira. Um, we too go together a long way back. <laughs> I just said to my Isha, you know, that was, you know, you were a baby a couple of years ago when, when we met. And um, so the most important part, and I think, you know, I will do it a little bit, you know, um, unorthodox, the uh, introduction. Um, we met uh, in an activist uh, environment, and um, that was also, you know, in a not non-academic, even, I mean, it's strange to say the nun, you know, but in a, in a different setting as a um, transnational um, yeah, activist uh, collective, QTBPOC um, festivals, where um, young people like you um, created spaces in Berlin, which we uh, before that never had. And again, we found ourselves in a space of translation of languages, but also experiences and diasporic experiences and intergenerational experiences. And um, I feel like uh, that uh, is a good um, yeah, uh, bridge to also your talk tonight um, uh, as, you, uh, as your work is on um, diasporic, Afri Afri uh, African diasporic uh, women, female writers, and um, translating those writers, and especially also looking for connections in, in their work. And I'm looking very much forward to it, and 
um, also to our conversation. So um, Jess is now um, going to give her keynote address for about 40 plus minutes. Well, we will see. And then we will have a conversation and we will also um, invite you for a Q&A after that. Okay, the stage is yours. Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen, and non-binary people. I'm so honored to be here. I'm so glad all of you are here. Thank you for um, sharing your time with me and um, being, uh, and being uh, available you know, and open to listen to me. So I hope um, we can talk afterwards. Um, thank you, Professor Wangi Waguru, for, for the invitation and the whole curators team, the whole festival team for making my presence here available, uh, possible actually. <laughs> I come all the way um, from Brazil, but I've been living in Berlin uh, since 2010, always in and out of Berlin. And it's so I'm so happy to see the Adefra team here because uh, you are my home here in Berlin, so thank you for, for being here. And um, it, it's so special to be here in Berlin because um, I believe Berlin made me a translator uh, for many reasons and situations. Um, Berlin made me to translate myself, to translate my siblings. Uh, it made me... To, to be open, to listen to um, other people from different backgrounds, and so it's very, very special evening for me. Um, I'm gonna talk about um, this journey uh, of me being a translator and me finding a way to, to do the work I've been doing since 2010 of translating myself and translating um, African diasporic authors, mainly um, women and queer uh, people. So I named my keynote today Zonzila Mubingana, uh, Traces of African Languages in the Diaspora, Challenging Colonial Grammars in Translation. Because um, like all the time when I'm translating um, African descent authors, I have been f finding or have been listening to their texts and the texts are telling me, they're showing me the way to translate them. It's really magical, you know? <laughs> I'm gonna give you some examples uh, during my, my talk. So first of all, I'd like to ask permission. In Brazil, we say ago. Which is a, <laughs> which is a Yoruba um, word that we use there in Brazil in um, the Hero communities, Candomblé communities. So I go to my youngest and I go to my um, eldest. <laughs> so I'm not here alone, as you see. I'm, I've been here with my friends from Adefra, and this is my family in Brazil. It's a family of translators. That's our um, research group uh, from the Federal University of uh, Bahia. We were called uh, Traduzindo no Atlântico Negro, Translating in the Black Atlantic. And we existed as a group linked, connected to the university for seven years. Now we decided to grow apart, but we're still doing things together. So I think it's a, a beautiful photo. and. Um, I am, I like, I, they are always with me and I'm always with them in our work and in our lives. So this group um, have published two books of essays about translation, translating in the Black Atlantic and all the challenges and um, beautiful things that we find on the way. So this is the first uh, volume, which was launched in 2017. And it's called something like Afro-Diasporic Nautical Shards or Houthis for Literary Crossings. So there's, there are several um, essays and articles dealing with um, 
translating authors like Toni Morrison um, and many others um, um, authors. And this is the second volume that we just launched in the, at the end of 2022. And it's um, something like issue-oriented dynamics in escaping roots of Afro-ancestral reconnecting performances. So our group um, understands translation not only as a uh, linguistic um, uh, operation, but also as a um, ontological tool. It's a way that we connect through the Atlantic. Uh, that's the way that we remember uh, our ancestors who spoke different languages when they were brought or when they were um, stolen from, from the continent and brought to, to the Americas. Um, and that's very interesting that in the way of um, reading and translating um, black authors, uh, we've been finding similarities between uh, Brazilian Portuguese and black English, for example. Um, and now I've been kind of trying to learn Kimbundo, which is a Bantu language, and I've been understanding me and that beautiful group I, I presented to you uh, that Things that we were said that was wrong or bad Portuguese were actually accents from our an ancestors. So it's really like new. It, we've been uh, learning Kimbundo for three years, like just before the, the pandemics. And then um, I'm learning, we are learning how the language sounds and it resembles and sounds like our great, great uh, our grandmothers. And we at school are always ta taught that it's wrong, it's bad Portuguese, we can't speak like that. Otherwise we won't succeed, etc. We've been talking about that um, during the festival and um, I just wanna share with you the perspective from Brazil too because there we've, we have lost the languages um, but there are traces everywhere. And uh, there's not only the, the languages, but there are the way we talk, the melody, the lexicon. There are a lot of words from Kimbundo mainly um, there are, in, are diction, in the dictionaries now in Portuguese. So the most beautiful words like dengo, cafuné, casula, cachaça. They are like normal uh, Portuguese words that we speak every day, but just recently um, I've been aware uh, that those are Kimbundo words or Kikongo words. Kimbundo and Kikongo are spoken in Angola and part of Congo. So it's, it has been really beautiful to understand that and to, to claim that, you know, as um, the language we speak, as the, yeah, I'm gonna, keep talking about that, like, this is Lelia Gonzalez. She's a very, she was a very, very important um, intellectual, politician, professor, anthropologist, and a human rights defender in Brazil. She was a Brazilian. Um, and she um, gave us um, many diff uh, very important key concepts for us to navigate in colonial Brazil. So she, um, thought of uh, Latin America as America, you know, as a continent, the whole continent, really um, based on um, African cultures, but also Amerindian cultures, like indigenous um, cultures. And th those cultures mingled also in the process of, of colonization. So she also calls the continent America Latina, it's like the, the, the warrior, um, Amefrica. So this, this concept has been really important for, for me, for us, to translate in the Black Atlantic. She also gives us the concept of Amefricanity, Amefricanidade. Um, and this Lelia Gonzalez thinkings, um, thinking offers an a La Afro-Latin America and Amerindian, Amerindian cultural, political, and linguistics perspectives 
of Latin America, which she called America Latina, Latina, as I just said. In, the way, in this way, she recognizes and highlights the presence of African and indigenous cultures within and across Latin America and the Caribbean and North America too. Uh, another uh, very important concept was pretugues, uh, which I would translate as uh, black Portuguese or even Brazilian Portuguese. And this concept, by, by turning the language, by making like a wordplay with Portuguese and, and say that it's preto, that it's black, um, she's doing, she's, she's recognizing the whole of the enslaved women who raised and fed the nation. So enslaved women, uh, they thought they, they raised people, right? Like, white people, like white children. And these children, they grew up and they speak like the enslaved women. So the, 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 the concept here is not that only black people speak Pretugues, but the whole nation uh, is uh, impregnant uh, with, the, with the, the African signs, you know, with the African and Bantu and also Yoruba. Um, traditions and um, words and syntax. Like the syntax is also very different in Brazil and Portugal, for example. No? We're going to see some examples later. So um, when I started translating, um, I was in Berlin, I was in Germany I, in 2010. I was. Um, I came for a training in this uh, program of the Bundesministerium für Zusammenarbeit. It's like the Ministry of uh, Cooperation, International Cooperation. Um, and then I almost, me and other fellows from Latin America, almost got away, uh, got back to Latin America without a certificate because there was no translation available. So translation saved me <laughs> because I say, hey, I need my certificate, it's gonna look pretty on my CV, right? <laughs> and all the Germans got their certificates and, um, and then they say, yeah, unfortunately, we don't have it in Portuguese or Spanish. And then I say, hey, I can translate them. <laughs> you know, I was learning German already at that time. And then they hired me to translate, so I translated it. And since then, I've been thinking about the, the role of translation as a sur survival tool for me and for, um, um, Af people of African descent in the world. So I bring here a, a quote for, uh, uh, of a, by a thinker. Uh, he's a professor in Brazil, Aja Gopalan, and he thinks a lot about these two sides of translation, how translation served colonization, and how at the same time translation can be a suburb, sub Sub subversive tool, you know, uh, thank you. Uh, he says something, I freely translated it, so to better understand the challenges of translation in post-colonization scenarios, is it, it is essential for us to first recognize how the process of colonization solidifies through the gradual framing of the native within the new oppressive and restrictive system and how the oppressed use that tool of oppression to rise above uh, oppression and, and to, to own the language, to twist the language, just to write poetry and to connect through colonial languages. So we must not forget that colonial lands translated people into men and women, for example, Eshu into devil, and difference as inferiority, inferiority. So it's also it's it's process of translations all also right. And what we've been trying to do is to use translation to to connect, not to to do those random translations of separation and segregation, but to connect and to be in relation. So for us, uh, born in the afterlives of the Middle Passage, of slavery, every gesture can be a path, not necessarily to return to, to the continent, but to move on and to uh, knowing that we, where we're from 
and knowing we are not alone. You know, for me, it was really important in Germany when I was living here, studying here, uh, to know the works of um, black German authors and to understand that I was, I was not alone here. You know, there have been people living here with history, with literature, with art, with resistance. So, yeah. Uh, then here I bring um, a quote for my advisor, <laughs> Professor Cajascosa, um, and she says something about uh, translation. We work really uh, with this concept of translation as ontological tool, right? And she says something like um, translation is a vector or a producer of a dialogue that is yet to come. We are really uh, willing to connect um, in the across the diaspora, and we do that. One of the tools that we use is translation. So, but not only words. We're not only translating words, but we're translating the drums, for example. We are dancing. We are translating um, epistemology, not only the written one. You know. So, all this uh, come into conversation when we are translating. Um, the text we, we, we are translating in the, of black authors, right? So here I would like to bring some examples from this uh, research group in Brazil. Ayala is a fellow researcher and she worked at her master thesis, she worked with uh, Dr. Afua Cooper, who is a, a poet from Jamaica who performed her, her um, poetry. So her, it's called dub poetry. It's like a reggae poetry um, thing. And Ayala did an amazing job, uh, not only translating the poem, but at her um, master's thesis defense, she also performed the poem uh, she translated. So it has to do with translating embodiments and understanding uh, lived lives, not only the words that are written, you know. Um, I bring this big quotation, but let, let's leave it for another time. So this is also a fellow uh, researcher and um, translator from Brazil, Jefferson Socorro, and he wrote this ma his master thesis uh, on call towards a critical and Afro-diasporic analysis of the English translation of the novel Poncia Vicencio by Conceição Evaristo, who is a very important and prominent author in Brazil. And this particular novel is um, seated in the post, um, um, post-abolition or post-slavery time in Brazil. And he's, um, he does a, an amazing analysis of the English translator, a translation who couldn't get a lot of, of symbols of the Bantu cultures. And uh, Jefferson is a um, religious um, person. So he, he's really within the, the realm of Nkisis and Orishas. So he could really um, do a good, a great analysis of, of the, the novel and the translation. And a lot got lost in translation because there are no words to translate in Kisi or Orishas and all the epistemology around it. So, and that's me. <laughs> I, I wrote um, a, master, a master's thesis, as I said, on Maya Im, uh, who is a who was a black German author, activist. And, and, and in my work, I selected 12 poems from the book uh, Blues and Schwarz Weiss, published in 1995. And um, what I tried to do was not only translate the words, but translate the context uh, to translate, um, to bring to the Lusophone world the the amazing things uh, Aim did with uh, the language. She really challenged uh, German language and its racist structures. So, um, unfortunately, or fortunately, it wasn't so hard to find similar expressions in Brazil. And I will show you later some, some, 
some examples. So, but it, so my work was not only translation. It's not only translation is a lot, but it was also like to to give the context because um, the Germanistic, the the German studies in Brazil is really uh, not aware or doesn't want to be aware of um, the literature by black authors um, in German. So I was also trying to talk to the German studies in Brazil and say, hey, there is this literature here. Um, why aren't we learning them, uh, re uh, reading them, translating them, talking to them, you know, making comparison studies, etc." So I don't think they, they've listened to me, <laughs> but uh, I'm still trying to, to, to engage on those conversations. So this is a photo from Maya Im. I think it's uh, nice that people see um, her face, our faces, you know, like I've been showing all my research group. Uh, and I've been told this photo was taken in Brazil around uh, 1989, the year I was born. So. <laughs> There's uh, some coincidences. Um, so there's another um, fellow researcher who wrote um, two important works, um, master thesis and a dissertation on the translation and reception of Carolina Maria de Jesus in Germany. So uh, Carolina was um, translated uh, very quickly in Germany, she her first book was written in was published in 1960, and then one or two years later, uh, this book was translated into German, and it has I think nine editions already. So she really did the the work of um, studying the translation and the words, um, and also the para texts like the texts, the foreword, afterword. Uh, the the cover, the book covers, and she noticed that um, Carolina Maria de Jesus was um, uh, th there's some mysteries in this history because um, we don't know who the translator was. She believes it it was a woman who signed as a, a man with a a, a male name. Um, and she and, and and this translator and the the people who wrote the foreword and 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 um, forward and afterward um, was really trying to fit Carolina Maria de Jesus into German into the into the politics in Germany. Like, but at that time, Germany was two countries, two different countries, and she was kind of used in the in the East for um, not used, maybe it's not the, the right word, but like her work was um, launched in, the, in East Germany as um, with the colors of the, the flag of Germany, and they were using the N word all the time. So it's really, it, it, it is a really important uh, work that she's done and yeah, she did this critical analysis and the whole context of Carolina. And just this year, I brought Carolina because just this year at this, um, in the US, I was at the ALA, the um, African Literature Association Conference, and I heard from a professor that, ah, Carolina was not really an author, you know? And I was like furious because I got furious because um, it has to do with the way she was translated. It has to do the, with the way she was edited in Brazil um, and the way she was translated too, because people didn't, didn't the people who worked on, on her book and translator, translation didn't know her context, didn't know how she lived and the, the words she used, which I come back from the to the beginning of um, my talk, she, Carolina uh, comes from a family from Minas Gerais, which is the the mine estate where the enslaved people worked on the mines, and it has um, it has a really deep and 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 
deep culture, Bantu culture there, like they have the Heinados and Congados. And Carolina comes from a family from this region. So she uses words that was not understood in Brazil by the editors. They just said like, it's bad Portuguese. So it was also badly translated into um, European languages. So for example, into English, her novel called Quarto de Despejo, which is something like eviction room or the room where you put things you don't need anymore, was uh, translated as child of the dark. Um, it's like, it, it was really like a horror novel or not even a novel because the, the literary criticism until recently didn't consider this book a novel, but a, jur a journal. In Germany, it was translated by, uh, as Tagebuch der Armut, which is also very, you know, complicated. Um, and it's a very deep and beautiful novel, I would say, like a really, um, where she's, she talks about her reality in the favela, in the slums in Brazil, and she talks about politics, and she talks about her dream of being published as a poet. And then when I heard that this year, that oh, she was not really a, a, an author, um, I, I'm sure it was due the translation work that was done um, on her work. So, um, come back into Zonzila Mubingana, who, which means something like in Kikongo, something like talking proverbial language. Some things can be translated, for example, um, and the po poetics of translation. So Carolina wrote, for example, this book of proverbs. And proverbs are very high literature, right? <laughs> and then when I heard that, that oh, she's not really an author, I remembered her, her book of proverbs. And um, when, a thing, when we think about the Bantu tradition of proverbs, and Sonzila Mubingana is a proverb, uh, and um, thinkers like Bunseki Fukiao, a Congolese um, intellectual, um, he's talking about how uh, Congolese and Bantu knowledge is passed by proverbs. By, and, and Carolina wrote a, a book of proverbs, which is, I don't think they, they, they have, it has new editions, but we can find it online in Brazil. Um, but, and recently in, in Bahia, there was a researcher doing work with this book of proverbs and linking this tradition to the Bantu tradition and making links and connections with the, the philosophy of uh, Buseki Funkiao, for example. So um, this is a photo of Carolina, Maria Jesus, this wonderful writer that we have. And this is um, a really short excer excerpt from this book um, that I was just talking about. And she said something, the night is beautiful, the, the, um, the heaven is sprinkled, sprinkled with stars, which is a very beautiful image. Um, me, uh, I am exotic and I would like to cut a piece of the heaven and do me uh, a dress. So it's really, really beautiful. And I bring this uh, quotation because it was really important for me when I was translating a poem by Maya Im, and I'll show you. So this poem called um, Nachtgesang, um, I read uh, it in, in, in German and then in Portuguese. Ich warte nicht mehr auf die besseren Zeiten, ich gehe auf die Straßen hinaus, Blutenduft auf der Haut, den Schirm in der Hand, den Fluss entlang, schwarzblauer Himmel über mir, Silbesterne dran, Bäume links und rechts, Sehnsucht auf den Ästen, Hoffnung im Herz. Ich liebe dich, ich warte nicht mehr. Um, yeah, as I said, it's a poem by, by Maya Im. Uh, and then 
The translation reads Canção Noturna. Não espero mais por tempos de boa aventura. Ando pela rua, aroma de flores sobre a pele, guarda-chuva na mão, ao longo do rio, céu preto azulado sobre mim, salpicado de estrelas, árvores, à esquerda e à direita, saudade nos ramos, esperança no coração. Eu amo você, eu não espero mais. So when I was trans in the process of translating it, I saw this image that Maya Im creates, the, the, the schwarz blauer Himmel über mir, Silbersterne dran, and then I remembered uh, Carolina with her sprinkled uh, Himmel, um, heaven sprinkled with uh, stars. So uh, it was really beautiful to find these ways of translating poetry, you know, um, and making those two very different authors to, to, to talk to each other through translation. So this is an, another example. Um, there was really a challenge. I translated um, uh, some poems by Tatiana Nascimento into German, which was really, really a challenge for me because Tatiana is a very uh, playful. She's a word wordsmith, and she uh, she's an amazing, amazing poet. And then she asked me to to translate some of her poems into German because she was coming to Germany for um, a conference or something, or a slam poetry uh, event. And um, and then I, I think I happened to be here at that time. And then we were walking uh, through the city in the uh, U-Bahn, in the metro, subway. And then I was explaining her some words that we saw in the in the in the train and then she wrote this poem uh, while in berlin um, and uh, she in portuguese she wrote in berlin eu talvez devesse deveria poderia quisesse rimar rimaria uns fonema assim controlarem com nem sei talvez schwarzfahren so she she rhymes a word, a verb in Portuguese, and the expression in German in, in her poem in Portuguese. So, um, my translation uh, reads, In Berlin sollte ich, vielleicht, müsste ich, könnte ich, hätte ich mal Bock aufs Reimen, würde ich ein paar Phoneme so reimen, kontrollieren mit, was weiß ich, Schwarzfahren. Um, the rhyme didn't work so good in German, but um, but I think what she, I think the message went through. I I, I believe you can tell me afterwards, <laughs> but the the her the message was really like this atmosphere that she was experiencing in Germany uh, of this uh, the system of uh, controlling people in the train because we don't have it uh, in Brazil, and then with this word. Schwarzfahren, right? I do, I, maybe I don't need to talk much about that, but um, for me to to uh, to to know knowing the work of Mayaim, uh, of uh, other uh, authors um, of African descent who write in German and reading black authors in Germany, I know that, for example, they usually uh, mark the word. Weiss, which means white, uh, or I know, not the verb to know. Uh, they usually mark it, put it in italics because it's um, a way of saying, of marking this identity, right? So it was important for me in the translation to mark it also, right? Um, and it's, uh, and I was really inspired by Mayaim, <laughs> of course, because she, um, she, she has some poems. Um, and written, and not only her, but uh, other authors, um, where they challenge this this realm of uh, expressions and words connected to the word Schwarz, to the work, uh, to the word Black, like Black Market, everything negative has this ad adjective, um, and it's not 
very different in German, so and it's not it's this uh, very similar in Portuguese too. So I did this um, contrast, just just the position between Weiss and Schwarzwaren. Um, yeah, so maybe for for people who, who don't speak German, Schwarzwaren means um, uh, using the public transportation without a ticket, but the word Schwarz black is there, and then Fahren is like to to drive or to move around, and it has been challenged by German uh, black Germans uh, as a racist uh, expression. So um, yeah. So I did this just a position so the audience in Germany can be challenged also by this poem and can think about how German language work. So another example, which is a funny uh, story I have, in 2015 when we came to this um, event where I met Peggy and Maisha and Eki, um, uh, I, I, I was already here, and I, we were going to give to offer a, a workshop on uh, Orishas and uh, non-binary identities. Um, and then I went to the airport to pick up a friend, Ani Gonzala, who is a um, visual artist from Brazil. And then I, I went there, and then she came out of the the place of the airport and she said, how can I say um, excuse me in, in German? And then I said, Entschuldigung. And she was like, Eschu, what? She like really screamed. <laughs> and they laughed a lot and everybody at the airport looked at us. And then it became like a kind of joke for us or a way of existing in, in Germany, in German language. Um, even though you don't speak the language or if the language sounds really difficult for, for people who are listening it for the first time. And then, yeah, we just uh, use this word in, the, in, our, in, in, in our black Brazilian community in, in Germany, like when you are in the U-Bahn and you say like, Schuldigung, Schuldigung, you know, like when, and then, <laughs> and then we say Schuldigung now. Uh, the thing is, Eshu is a very important um, force for us in the in the diaspora in Brazil. Eshu is a Orisha who comes from Nigeria Yoruba tradition, and he is the path. He is the owner of the path. So usually, when you have to uh, inside Candomblé and out also outside, when you you ask issue permission to travel, you ask for permission to, to move around. So it really makes sense for me to, to by when translating um, Tatiana, who, who does this kind of things in Portuguese, um, to use um, <laughs> uh, because then I don't erase the way she writes in Portuguese and I can bring somehow um, her her, how she sounds in Portuguese or the, the work she does in the language, I can like move it um, and, and give the German audience some idea of the inventiveness of, of this poet. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then I was really thinking about how, how German mark uh, marks differences and how also Portuguese and, and European languages, the ones I know, um, mark the difference and how can we uh, mark our difference in German too because like immigrants and people living here and um, no native speakers, we have our own way of saying things sometimes. So this is also a way, a way to to make it comfortable here somehow, to bring this force that is so important for us, to bring a shoe um, to to our living abroad, and also, um, ha yeah, having this force with us, not forgetting that he guides us, and he guides also translation. He's also the Orisha, the messenger between two words, so he's a translator too. 
another example, it's uh, another poem by Maya Im called uh, Exotic. I'm going to read it in, in German and then talk a little bit about the translation process. Exotic. Nachdem sie mich erst anschwärzen, zogen sie mich dann durch den Kakao. Und mir schließlich weismachen zu wollen, es sei vollkommen unangebracht, schwarz zu sehen. Um, so, as you see, uh, my, the poet, she uses, she brings a lot of uh, expressions in German with um, this, this radical, this, this word schwarzen, oder, or durch den Kakao ziehen, which is a very old expression. Um, and also weiß, weise machen, ne? weiß machen. She does all this um, plays with, with the language. And this was kind of fun to translate, although the content is not so joyful, but it really gives me the, the, the room to, to create and to be creative. So I used um, words like, to translate, né? I'm going to read the translation and then I comment. Exotismo. Depois de primeiro me denegrirem, eles então mangaram de mim. Finalmente, para finalmente quererem me esclarecer que é completamente inadequado ser negativa. So I think it was for me it was a uh, um, um, I was satisfied with the translation because I could find um, similarities between German and Portuguese with the word anschwärzen, for example, which is uh, make black or to denigrate or to, to make something dirty or um, durch den Kakao ziehen is a very old expression um, and it means making fun of someone. But we also know that cacao is a tropical fruit and then uh, chocolate and how German sometimes goes with uh, chocolate and black people. And we hear that on the street, like this uh, comparisons. Um, although this poem is, is from 1985, you know, it's still very um, actual and, and, and current. And then um, Weise machen and Weise machen, she, do, she does this, um, this word play with this expression, like to, um, how do I say it in English? <laughs> um, to, to make someone believe something, you know, but wh which is not true, but also like she takes out the, the word E and then it becomes Weismachen, to make white. Um, and I found a, a word, esclarecer in Portuguese, which also means like um, enlighten, no? like if you enlighten me, like it has this double uh, meaning in Portuguese too, you know, if you, if you're dark, you can't be, you need to be enlightened, to be understood, and, and you know. And then schwarz zu sehen is something like um, to be pessimist or to, to, to look at the world in a negative way. And then I found negativa, which means negative, but nega is a word in Portuguese um, that we don't use much anymore, only in private spheres, but it's like to refer to a, to a black woman, you know. It's not the same as the N-word here, but, you know, I, I cut the, the word into two, and then you have both meanings. So I um, really believe that I could bring uh, the message across, or I tried. <laughs> I hope to hear your comments afterwards. So now I have more, more, let me see my time. I have more examples here from, from translations into Spanish. But since today we're talking about food at the in, um, um, intersectionality panel, I thought it would be nice to bring this example. 
this novel uh, by Jorge Amado, who is not a, a black author, but really works on black culture in, in Bahia specifically, um, it was the, the novel was translated into um, Spanish, and then we were analyzing the, the, um, the translation. And then we saw that the, the translator chose to, to translate Akarajé and Abara, who are, uh, which are very important soul food, <laughs> as we were talking earlier. Um, and it's very, very important in Brazilian culture because through Akarajé, um, enslaved women could buy their freedom. And there, there is still in Nigeria Akara, so it is a, a kara with fillings. Other, it's different, but it's the same. Oh, it's a sample. <laughs> and the translator chose to translate akarajé, akarajé as pastel, which is cake. You know, and I'm not going into the whole scene, but he, they, the the translator, I don't know if, if it's a woman or, uh, they they chose to to translate it as a cake, which totally make us lose the reference, the culture, everything. And then abara, which is a kind of a karaja, but it's not fried. It's cooked in the banana leaf. It's delicious. <laughs> he translated it as arroz dulce, which is milchreis, or is uh, uh, huh? Sticky rice. Yeah, sticky rice, yeah. So he really they, I don't know their gender, so they really changed the whole cultural um, thing, you know. But what uh, really brought me into attention was here at the end, uh, the author is talking about atabaki, agogos, chocalhos, cabasas, which are uh, musical instruments, and he chose to translate it as primitive, primitive instruments and that was like what <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah it's just like examples of um how when we are not aware or when we don't know the culture and we when we don't give us the time to make our researches by when translating things s s s such things can happen you know so it's just an opposite example of the movement I've, tr I've been trying to do while translating across the Atlantic. So here are just photos of Akarajé, and then, you know, it became something definitely different. Pastel can be a cake or also this empanadas, I don't know, in, in English. It depends on the country also. So another example, um, by when I was doing the uh, proofreading of a translation um, of a poem by John Brand, who is a Caribbean, Canadian, uh, queer, black author. And then she uses, um, we was children, she uses this uh, construction, right? And then the, the, it was translated like nos éramos crianças, like we were children. They just like corrected her English. And by doing so, they just not erase the culture because it's how people in the Caribbean speak. And it's, and it's also like we speak in, in Brazil. We speak nos era criança and everybody's gonna understand you because you, you mark the plural once in the nos, in the uh, prover, uh, pronoun, and then everybody's gonna understand you. It's the way we speak. And, um, and since I've been trying to learn Kimbundo, I've learned that a lot of Bantu language just mark the plural once, too. Kimbundu, like I'm not a linguist, but I've learned that the, the similar uh, structure, syntax uh, structure happened in Kimbundu, and maybe it's, it's not an accident that black people in the Caribbean and in Brazil speak like that, right? So it's really important to have these traces in mind when translating. So we cannot mistake the, the poem and not 
correct what happened, for example, with Carolina Maria de Jesus. She was overcorrected and corrected and considered um, a, not an author, you know. And that's why, like, this is the, the, the traces that we have to have in mind. I'm coming to the end. Just going to give some examples. Um, I've translated Grada Quilomba into Portuguese. Uh, into Brazilian Portuguese, um, she's a very known, uh, very known author in Germany. She published, actually, this book in in Germany. She wrote in English, although she's a Portuguese author um, uh, with roots in Angola and uh, São Tomé e Príncipe. And by translating this book in Brazil. I noticed a lot of things, like, the, for example, the POC, this expression, whoever a lot of people know, and we use this this expression a lot in the English context or in the north, north, global north. We don't use it in Portuguese, and I translated it as um, pessoas racializadas, like racialized people, because in Brazil, if you, we, we literally translate it, it's going to go somewhere else, different from the from the term in English. And then I got the the proofreading, and then the the person said, "No, POC is proof of concept. It's wrong. It's like it was really like not asking, not you know. And uh, racialized doesn't exist in Portuguese. Racializado is not a word. It's not in the dictionary. So." So we don't exist. <laughs> and then by doing, s in this experience, um, I understood that my living experience was really important to translate because I've been to the, the, the um, uh, global north and I've been classified as a person or people of color. I know these communities and I understand the text, I've read the text, I know the author, and still I got this correction, you know. And it was a struggle to make them understand that P POC is people of color, which is, yeah, funny, but, you know, <laughs> it's double work for the translation translator because you have to do the, translator, the, the translation and then lecture that to editors and they don't believe you. <laughs> it's like, yeah, but I've, I've been there, you know? And then, and also the term plantation, which she uses in, in English, and they wanted, they wanted plantação, which is the direct translation, but it's not because we know plantation is a system, it's a monoculture, slavist, uh, sexist system, uh, and it existed in Brazil too, in the in the Americas, but then it became plantation uh, plantação, which doesn't bring to the context of colonization. Plantação can be anything that you have on your yard, or you know, plantação of orange. It doesn't link to the to the context to our context actually. So for me, uh, um, it, it's sad. Of course, people understand. I made an, a food. Uh, uh, footnote, but the title is Plantação, you know, but it's, it, it, I, for me, a lot, got, a, a lot got lost in translation there, because we lose the, um, the thread between Brazil and the other parts of America, you know, it's like, and it intercepts our communication to across the diaspora, so that's also problematic for me. So another, exa another example, it's the translation of uh, Denise Ferreira da Silva, who is also a Portuguese speaker, speaking uh, intellectual, very important in the black studies, um, in the global north too. She um, published uh, her PhD um, work uh, in 2000, uh, 2007, and only last year, um, I have translated it into Portuguese, into her mother tongue, for example. So we've been talking about that in, in, in African languages, but it also happens in, in, in colonial contexts also that authors sometimes have to go out 
to to have their work um, understood and published, and then years later, de decades later, it gets a translation, if, when they get a translation. So I'm coming to the end, <laughs> bear with me. Um, Usually when people, I've been asked a lot like, ah, wow, why did you learn German? Or why did you want to learn German? You're crazy, you know? <laughs> and then sometimes, earlier I, I answered, yeah, because I wanted, I learned German because I wanted. And then I started uh, answering like Octavia Butler. I learned German because I wanted power. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't have any power, and I thought German would give me some. Um, you know, Brazil. Uh, the second most spoken language in Brazil is German, because yeah, because of immigration, and also because of um, the uh, firmas, like the oh my god, the the business you know, the, the business uh, Germany has in Brazil. So, um, and now, some years ago, I've started um, answering that I've learned German because I didn't have any choice. Like, I did, I, I couldn't learn Kimbundo, I couldn't learn Yoruba, I couldn't learn Luo, I couldn't learn Kiswahili. And still today, it's really hard to learn, to get near African languages in Brazil. It's really like something, most of people don't even know a name of an African language, although 56% of the population is black and African descent. So I, I would like to highlight this initiative at the Federal University of Bahia. Since 2020, um, there are Kimbundo and Yoruba courses being offered by, to the community. So and it's uh, thanks to the research group Yorubantu, uh, who is, uh, which is a, a group focused on Yoruba and Bantu epistemologies in liter literacy, linguistic and cultural studies in Brazil. So now I'd like to show you um, a translation, <laughs> just to, to end. That is um, actually the poem I wrote, I, I read in the, at the opening but I read it in, in Portuguese and a lot of people wanted to, to hear and, or read it into, in English. And it, it was actually written in English because we really wanted to reach out the, the communities across the, the Atlantic. Um, and then me and, and Bruna, Bruna and I, we did this translation, this um, semiotic translation. We did a poem, a um, video poem of this poem. Let's see if it works. The linguistic pluralism we have in the diaspora can be a paradigm for the transnational struggle. Also through it, we can look at our history in a global, not only local, level. It can also be a means to less isolation, more exchange, less intrusion, more us about us. We are archives. We have a linguistic, sensual, memorialistic, futuristic collection that goes beyond tongues and national borders. This common tongue we share as a productive space of critical creative fabulation is made of mythical poetical motivations. It is ourselves. It is the production of ourselves. To translate ourselves is a mirror looking learning process, re encounters, imagined, dreamed, articulated and decoded by your ancestors, re-encounters with them. There is so much more than the written, modern, colonial, European languages to be translated among us. There are our eyes and looks and the way our bodies move. There are dances and smiles 
and secret plans and symbols and sounds and maps, sensations. There is the intricate intermingle of ourselves and there are our differences, all of them impossible to translate. But still we play and trace our plans, still we feel, still we pray, always for a shoe. We need to challenge and scrutinize our differences within the black diaspora, the grammars of blacknesses around the world, and the practice of translation within our transnational communities can be of great use in this exercise. This one is for black folks. Esse aqui é pro povo preto. This one is for the snap divas. This one is for the mushoshos, the clickers, the mm-hmm's. This one is for the dykes, the greatest song masters. Shout out to the multilingual sapatonas. This one is for our ancestors who spoke in tongues. This is a celebration poem. We share a body language in color, shape, and manner. I call my sister and she says, hello. She feels understood when I laugh at her jokes, even though she can't even begin to grasp mine. I taste her interdentals when I have breakfast, then brunch, then dinner. My tongue tires trying to memorize how to stand between my teeth and the air I breathe. I call my sister and she asks, how are you? I say, tô bem. She laughs because it is so funny. My accent is, she tells me. She eats the arroz e feijão I cook for her. She chews the nasal bowl I offer her, but she never swallows. I was never able to get a porra do visto, but she comes here whenever she pleases. She never knocks, she's funny like that. She feels at home because I try to sound like her, because she recognizes the joy and the pain, but she can also fly away. I wonder if she can really understand me, if we can unify the struggle, if she can't see me struggle to understand her. If the struggle is real, elas que lutem. Amém. A luta continua. I don't speak Portuguese. I don't speak Spanish. I speak português. I am cheia de manha. I like it when my dango me faz um cafuné. And then when I give her a cheiro. If black internationalism can't exist without translation, who are the ones translating? If translation is the key to the cultural borders, who drew them, who got the passports, how can we belong to a state nation when all they ever did to us was teach us how to long, betrayed by national tongues who didn't raise us? Why would we call them mothers? I'm the Earth's daughters. The oceans will not be my grave. They'll be my ways. Through them I shall walk and connect. Find a friend you really like. Grab a bottle of something. Your throat will need it. Translation is a conversation. You can cook together, missing vegetables you grew yourselves. Don't chase the words. They'll come to you. Instead, sit by a breezy place. Let the sun bath you. Listen to your friend. Create, write, and make. Dream up and remember, remember, remember. Thank you so much. <laughs> Mirum
Thank you so much. Thank you, Jess, for this um, very rich, um, um, yeah, very deep uh, talk. Um, I have a lot of questions, <laughs> and I think I will probably only come to one question. Um, but let me first uh, um, give, uh, yeah, try to you know uh, get a little um, into that. Uh, I really felt like um, what you you know when you line you lined out your work and your presentation itself was already an um, archive of uh, black knowledge productions. Um, so I want to thank you for that to show us to. Um, uh, guide us through um, the works which is be done in Brazil, and um, it gave me um, uh, a lot of power, uh, a lot of energy to see, you know, how powerful um, there are young people working on um, black literature and um, also working on um, on translation as a tool. So that was um, uh, the first I'm taking from, from your talk, that uh, there is a rich archive of um, black uh, uh, writing and black um, uh, uh, translation. And you said, you know, translation is to be connected, to stay in connection. I found that very powerful, and I want to get into that in a minute with you a little bit more, um, what that means um, more in detail. Um, and another uh, um, uh, part I'm taking from your talk is um, that you spoke a lot uh, to um, the necessity and actually also showed us how to do that um, on uh, decolonizing canons, decolonizing lit literature, decolonizing um, texts. and. Um, for that, uh, you sh uh, gave us a couple of examples, and I felt, you know, being thrown back to my own um, uh, uh, literature knowledge and what was, you know, being forced onto us. Um, and certainly, with the examples of um, uh, translating titles, um, what you uh, on Carolina Maria de uh, Jesus. Uh, so we see the colonial archives, which are. Um, uh, uh, translated, and they are meant to be translated because that's exactly what um, it should be. You know, the people should be um, reached with that. So um, that is not a mistake or something. So it's exactly oh, you know, um, ch uh, 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 children of the darkness or child of darkness. You know, that is what they want to people pick up and exactly to get this colonial desires, which is behind that. Um, so I think my, m my first question, and we will probably only have one so far for the time, is um, for whom do you translate? Um, who you have in mind or what you think, um, you know, um, in changing with that, you know, decolonizing the, the, uh, um, the canon? So who you have in mind when you're translating. Thank you. Thank you for this question. Uh, <laughs> I'll be very democratic and say <laughs> I translate for everybody, but <laughs> yeah, because I think um, this work should, this works uh, should be available for everybody, but I really have a reader in mind that was, that is um, diasporic people, people of African descent, but also like me, like the younger me who wanted to read, um, to have access to these readings when I couldn't speak English or German. And um, and the younger me who was uh, studying Germanistic in Brazil and was really like feeling out of their place, you know. So I translate for for yeah <laughs> for my communities across across the across the Atlantic. Like I translate for uh, my 
communities in Brazil. I translate Maya Im and um, Grada Quilomba and Denise for my communities in Brazil, but also I translate for my communities in, in, in Germany too, when I'm translating Tatiana. But yeah, like, but it's good that it's available for everyone. <laughs> it's also mm -hmm. part of it. It's mm -hmm. not one and another, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, uh, I, I was thinking that we probably uh, would answer this way, and um, I just, you know, want to encourage you um, because when I was listening to you, I felt like, yeah, you you are translating for um, for the diaspora, and it is almost like correcting something, you know, that would be going in the direction of uh, uh, decolonizing the canon. Um, but also what really touched me was um, to make uh, authors um, uh, uh, talk and speak to each other. So I feel when I'm you know, listening to your work and how you lined out your, um, how you do that, you know, like that you are actually also translating for Tatiana and for May, for example, you know, bringing both of them into um, a connection with each other, and by that also creating something, you know, and at the end in this video it was being talked about, um, the grammar of blackness, um, I love that a lot, um, and um, it is, you know, like bringing, you know, knowing the, the way of writing, how Tatiana was writing, and then finding that back in Maya Eames' uh, uh, poetry, and that is something what is actually, it, it's a beautiful picture of us connected in the diaspora. Also, we might not know us each other personally, but it is the layers of our shared experiences. And I think that it's very worth it to translate exactly for these shared experiences, because uh, it's usually not be done, as you showed us with this, um, strange titles, they came up, came up with that. So maybe I can um, uh, uh, add another question and then we have we also want to get the audience um, uh, uh, into the conversation. Um, in the beginning you said, you know, Berlin made you translating yourself. <laughs> and this is really what I want to uh, uh, ask you uh, uh, again, if you could, you know, elaborate a little bit uh, on that, what you, what do you mean by that, and how how does this work? Thank you again for this wonderful question. Wow, it's deep. Um, yeah, Berlin was the first place I've been um, out of Brazil, out of Sao Paulo. I, no, I went, I've been to other cities, but I was I was twenty the first time I came, <laughs> and. I, I got all these questions, you know, those typical questions about what are you doing here? Why do you speak German? Or why do you want to learn German when you're going back? <laughs> and <laughs> very typical questions. And um, I saw myself try, uh, having to translate myself, you know, because a lot of times I was confused by, um, People thought I was from the U.S. and then I had to say no because they have a picture of Brazilians, and sometimes I didn't pat, I didn't fix, I didn't fit in that um, picture. Um, even the picture of the Brazilian students who come to 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 study in Germany, I didn't fit. I didn't fit the other images people threw at me. So. I have to be constantly translating myself, <laughs> like literally, and um, and also this this story with the certificate. You know, um, I really wanted that. <laughs> I worked hard for that, and they, they, you know, they gave it to all the Germans, and then we were like, mm, where is ours? You know, and then I, I literally had to translate the, the, the certificate, but it was like constantly, like every day translating uh, my existence um, in a lot of different levels. Uh, why you learn in German, why you hear, why you look like that, why you blah, blah, blah. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I was tar it's, it's tiring, but um, yeah, I, I could find ways uh, through community 
to be to be more comfortable and and to make people like me comfortable i think through translation to yeah i think it's something like that <laughs> Yeah, that seems to be a um, very common experience to be in in white Berlin. I mean, um, you had uh, also an example um, of uh, 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 Tatiana's uh, work, you know, who, who also uh, wrote a po poem on being in Berlin, as we know also from um, uh, Audre Lorde, uh, who was wandering around in Berlin, in the cold Berlin. <laughs> and having this inner monologues of being basically also translating themselves, yeah. Um, we do have a little bit more time, time is rushing, um, so we would encourage you to uh, join the conversation if you have a question for Jess or um, a comment, please feel free. Uh, we have Melody over there and then Eki. Uh, melody behind and then yeah please go ahead well I just want to say thank you Jess for this wonderful presentation it was really yeah just I don't know it just feels very wonderful to be seen I felt very seen even though you speak about many experiences that I don't know anything about you know and I think it says a lot about yeah this conversation we're having in across diaspora and I think uh, something I also picked up is sort of this theme around water um, in the Middle Passage that you talked about, Marion Kraff talked about as well. And yeah, and I thought it was um, very beautiful. Um, and last point that I want to make is I'm wondering a little bit about, or maybe it's a question about sort of uplifting some of the authors. You know, when you talked about Maria Jesus and her work, and it seems like, um, like we say in African-American English, she hasn't been given her flowers, right? And so it reminds me a lot of the work that Alice Walker did for Zora Neale Hurston, who had been, who had really fallen completely into oblivion, even though she had written so, um, so much, contributed so much to the canon of African-American literature and wrote in our language, right? She wrote in the language that her people spoke. Um, and so I'm wondering how you see your role in sort of excavating also and honoring our ancestors through the work of translation. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Um, yes, I also want to say thank you, Jess. I really enjoyed listening to you. And um, I, um, I was just thinking two things. Um, first, I think it was Melody that said to me outside in the foyer that Wangui said that we're all translators. And um, I, I thought about this sitting here and listening to you, and when you said you were translating yourself, I also thought, like, as black people in the world, we're all translating ourselves all the time. Because there's often this that we have to explain something. And, um, and then moving between languages is also this translation happening all the time. And um, when you were talking about this, the word um, plantation, this is something that stuck. This is something a bit more like a, a very practical question, but I thought I would just ask you anyway, but maybe it's something like a work in progress. Um, how how could, can we translate the word translate, uh, plantation in, in, into Portuguese? Is there, or would you need a footnote always? Or would there be a word? I'll answer both. Thank you so much, you both, for, for your questions. Um, I see the, the work I do with that, the group I've been linked to, and also like we are also part of a group of, of, translator, of translators here uh, as an, an archival work, as like giving authors who have been erased in the history of literature in the canal, giving them flowers, because they haven't given us flowers and they deserve it. Um, so I, I really see my work as this uh, work of, of honoring the, these authors. For me, like for me, it was really like a special moment to get to know um, black German authors, because they haven't given me 
gifts, you know, like ways to breathe in, 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 in Germany. And um, I think it's my way of giving them back, you know, the, this possibility of, of existence elsewhere. So um, in many ways, um, black German authors gave me a place and not only authors, but activists and people in general who have been lived here before and are living here now um, have made space for me to be here, right? And um, I think translation gives these authors and these histories um, also a, a place to live on somewhere else in another language, in another time, in another space like literally in another geography. It's really nice to see, to, to, to see people reading uh, Mayaim in Brazil. In Mozambique, they, they had um, also last year an event and they, they were reading uh, my, my translations of Mayaim. So it's really beautiful to see this author and this work uh, living on in across time, across space. So, yeah, I, I, I see my work as, as doing this too. Um, and Eki, yeah, I, I thought a lot about this translation, translating plantation. For me, the first choice was to keep it because it really makes us in Brazil <coughs> understand, like the larger population, to understand that we are also part of this global history because sometimes we, you know, we don't learn that at school. Like maybe if 10 years from now, things have changed, but we don't learn the history the way it was, or, or we just learn one perspective of history. So for me, it was really important to keep plantation because plantation, as I said, is, uh, is a system, and it happened in many places, also in Brazil. And we have many words for that. We have engenho, which is the... Um, the sugarcane place, like Engenho de Açúcar. Uh, we had Fazenda, farm. We had Canavial, which really like the, the sugarcane farm. And Canavial is a very, uh, it's a word that is, it is more alive in the national consciousness. But specifically, they didn't want that word, you know? Um, Canavial, cafezal, like in the northeast, uh, the plantations were mainly sugarcane uh, plant, plant plantations. And in the southeast, it was uh, coffee, beans. Uh, so ca cafezal is the coffee plantation. Uh, um, and I, I suggested all these um, this words because I think it would connect more to the history of, of Brazil like more, that more directly. But they chose plantação, which is something else for us. Like in the, so now I think like people have read the, the, the book and they understand the connection, but still it was interesting to see this resistance of using engenho de açúcar, canavial, cafezal, even cativeiro, captivity, memories of captivity, maybe like trans, retranslating from Portuguese. Cativeiro, yeah, it, that, that's a word that is, it's more alive in the, in the national consciousness, but they didn't want to go there, although the book, you know, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, that shows us again, um, you, you were uh, talking about um, translation as a survival uh, tool and um, also an, it's a tool of uh, survival of uh, our memory. Also, that's how we see, you know, when translation is not embedded into the um, and collective community experience, then it is wiping out our experience and, and memory with that and so to work against that or to work you know towards for our communities thank you very much for your work and also for all the other w wonderful beautiful uh, translators in the room thank you very much also for organizing and bringing us together yeah thank you